we're now going to pick up with uh, the digestive system. The digestive system <clears throat> is important because this is how we maintain the metabolic need, how we cover the metabolic need for all of our different cells. So all of the cells in your body are going to live on the food that you consume with your diet. So cells live on all food that is consumed. Now, we have to process and break down that food as it comes in. So it's not just as simple as exposing the cells to, say, a hamburger. That hamburger has to be processed so that we can break it down to individual macronutrients or macromolecules that the cell then can utilize. And this whole process is going to occur in the digestive tract. So food stuff, stuff um, that you consume in your diet, travels through the GI tract. And you can see the gastrointestinal tract here begins at the oral cavity and ends at the rectum and the anus. Okay, so GI tract, again, that is the gastrointestinal tract. And it begins at the mouth. Now, in the mouth and in the oral cavity, we have teeth that help us to chew or masticate the food that's consumed. In addition to the teeth that begin to mechanically break down the food that we consume, we also have our tongue, which helps us to taste the food. And alongside of the nose, the tongue and the nose act to help us protect us from food that's either rancid or rotten or that may not be suitable for our consumption. If it tastes bad and smells bad, probably shouldn't consume it through the rest of the digestive system. We also have a series of glands called salivary glands. And as you're chewing, saliva from the salivary glands is being produced and is being mixed into the food. In that saliva, there are enzymes. And those enzymes begin a chemical digestion process. In particular, one enzyme that is abundantly present in saliva is an enzyme called amylase. And again, we know it's an enzyme because of ASE. Amylase is really good at taking a large molecule called starch, which is a glucose storage molecule in plants, and to break that starch down into individual glucose molecules. So as we chew the food, we're mechanically breaking it down, mixing it with saliva that then begins to process things like starch through the enzymatic action of amylase to break that starch down into the individual macro molecule called glucose, which is going to be something that the cells can actually utilize. Can't directly utilize starch, we have to break that starch down. So from here, from the mouth, once we sufficiently chewed the food and mixed it with saliva, we are going to begin to move that food towards the stomach. And we have a tube that leads to the stomach to facilitate this process. At the base of the oral cavity, as we've already talked, discussed with the respiratory system, we have a cavity of convergence called the pharynx. And the pharynx is the gatekeeper between the trachea leading into the respiratory system and the esophagus leading into the digestive system. The muscles of the pharynx are going to facilitate movement of food towards the stomach by swallowing action. Okay, so the pharynx, you swallow food into the esophagus.
The esophagus is this long tube that leads down into a pouch-like organ called the stomach. Now, the stomach is a big pouch or a pouch-like stru structure, and it's going to facilitate a couple of things. One is going to be a site of storage for food. You consume a meal, and it may take you 20 minutes to consume that meal, and then the material that you just consumed is going to be deposited into the stomach where it's going to be stored. In addition to that storage, the stomach is also going to facilitate some further chemical digestion. So we have chemical digestion that's occurring in the stomach. And in particular, this is being facilitated by enzymes that are catalyzing reactions to break down other molecules. And then also acids. The stomach is a very acidic environment, and those acids help to break down things like protein. It helps to denature and lengthen the protein so that it can be chopped up into smaller pieces. The last thing that the stomach is going to do, in between meals, we want to have facilitated deposit of foodstuffs, digested food, into the small intestine to facilitate the absorption, the nutrient absorption process. So we store food in the stomach, and then the stomach is also responsible for time deposit of food into the small intestine. And because of this, we can consume a meal for 20 minutes or in 20 minutes, and then it will slowly be released into the digestive, lower portions of the digestive system, the small intestine, for nutrient absorption over a prolonged period of time, three, four, five hours. Okay, so from the stomach, we next head into the small intestine. In the small intestine, we're going to have some additional digestion. So the food that you consumed is going to be further broken up into smaller and smaller components. But we're also going to begin to absorb some nutrients. One of the nutrients that's going to be absorbed here is going to be water. And this is water that you consume as beverage or the water that's being released as you're digesting the foodstuffs that you consume, that nice juicy hamburger or that nice juicy apple. So we'll also, in addition to the water, have some nutrient absorption. Again, we have to break our nutrient down into a small enough size so that we can facilitate the movement into the bloodstream or into the lymphatic. Uh, into the lymph of the lymphatic system. The small intestine is also going to have, in addition to the digestion and the absorption functions, some endocrine function as well. It's a secondary endocrine tissue. Main purpose is in absorption and digestion, but also hormones are going to be produced. And these hormones are actually going to be regulated to the digestive process itself. So endocrine tissue, endocrine function as well, related to digestion. Once we've moved through the about 10 feet of small intestine, the food is going to be well processed. It's been further digested. A lot of the nutrients and water has been absorbed. Endocrine hormones are being released into the bloodstream to help regulate the digestive process and to indicate satiety and the feeling of uh, of fullness. That next portion of the intestinal tract is going to be the large intestine. So this very processed food product is now going to enter into the large intestine. In the large intestine, we're going to have some additional water absorption. We're going to have our very last or final nutrient absorption. And these two processes combine to 
dry out and denutriate the food to begin to generate a material known as fecal matter or feces. So in the large intestine, we begin to form feces, and at the very latter portions or end portions of the large intestine, we have a portion of the large intestine that's called large intestine that is called the sigmoid colon, named after its sort of sine wave shape or sigmoidal shape, that is going to act as a storage site for that produced fecal material. Directly after the sigmoid colon, we have two final stru structures in the digestive system. And they are the rectum and the anus. And these two portions of tissue or portions of the digestive system are responsible to remove the feces out of the individual. And that fecal material that's been produced is going to consist of undigested food or undigested nutrients, nutrients that the human body cannot actually process. A big example of this is um, fiber, dietary fiber or roughage. This is material that we consume, especially in plant-based foods, that we have no ability to really break down. And so it doesn't get absorbed through the intestine. It remains in the fecal material. Uh, we're also going to have bacteria that are present in the fecal material. A lot of these bacteria are what we call good bacteria. They help with the digestive process and the health of the digestive system. Uh, and so it's okay for these bacteria to be present, but during times of illness, we actually may have an increase in unwanted bacteria as well, and this is just another mechanism for removal of those um, poor or bad microorganisms. Now, in addition to the digestive tract leading from the mouth all the way through uh, the rectum and the anus, there are also some additional organs that support digestion. And I'm going to refer to them as digestive organs. So we have the digestive tract and then we have digestive organs. And the digestive organs are going to support digestion. And you probably are already thinking about a few of these. One of the most uh, prominent is going to be the liver. This is going to be our largest digestive organ. The liver is uh, a multifunctional organism. It's going to help out with glucose storage. One of the other things that it does is it produces this material called bile. So the liver is going to begin to produce... Bile. And bile is going to be used in a uh, fat digestion process, and it begins in the liver. Uh, in, in addition to the bile production, uh, as I've already mentioned, stores glucose and other nutrients. And then we also are going to have some enzymatic processing of nutrients that occurs. And one of the big ones here, one of the big ways that the liver processes nutrients is to take individual glucose molecules that have been released from the digestive tract into the bloodstream to pick up those individual glucose molecules and to begin to put them into a molecule called glycogen. Glycogen is a branch chain uh, glucose storage molecule. And so we're going to package glucose up, store it in the liver, and then it can be called upon by insulin and glucagon to regulate blood glucose levels. A second digestive organ is an organ called the gallbladder. All one word. Now the gallbladder 
the bile that's being produced up here by the liver is actually going to travel through this pretty unique duct work system called the hepatic ducts. And we lead into the common hepatic duct, and then we can actually send that gallbladder, um, or I'm sorry, the bile rather, being produced by the liver, being transported by the hepatic duct into the gallbladder. So the bile is going to be received by the gallbladder from the liver. And in the gallbladder, that bile is going to be stored. We're also going to have a little bit of water removal from that gallbladder, I'm uh, sorry, from that bile solution in the gallbladder. And so we're going to concentrate. the bile that's being produced. And as we store and concentrate that bile, when we consume a meal that has a lot of fat, so maybe it's a, a hamburger and french fries, contains a lot of fat, and that comes in and it begins to make its way through the stomach and into the small intestine. As you can see here, leading from the gallbladder, we have this thing called the common bile duct. And the common bile duct is going to help to move Gall, this concentrated bile from the gallbladder into the small intestine. And that fatty material that you consume is actually going to be processed and prepared for absorption by the small intestine by the gallbladder bile that's being released. So concentrated and stored bile is released from the gallbladder when we need to digest fat. All right, one final digestive organ, and that is going to be the pancreas. Now, we've already talked about the um, endocrine function of the pancreas. The pancreas is located right here behind the stomach. You can't really directly see it, but you can see here the pancreatic duct. Uh, of course, we've already detailed the endocrine function of the pancreas. And in all reality, the endocrine function of the pancreas is actually going to be digestive in nature because it deals with homeostasis of glucose levels in the blood. But in addition to its endocrine function, the pancreas also exhibits exocrine function. And you'll remember that an exocrine gland is going to be a gland that secretes a solution into a duct. So we have this duct that runs through the pancreas called the pancreatic duct. And other cells, the non-endocrine cells, or what we would call exocrine cells of the pancreas, are going to secrete a solution known as digestive juice. So we're going to secrete this solution called dig digestive juice. And in that digestive juice, we're going to have a variety of ingredients. One of the ingredients is going to be this ingredient called bicarbonate. So the digestive juice is releasing things like bicarbonate, which is going to aid in pH balance. In order to digest things like proteins, we actually have to increase the acidity of the solution containing the proteins. And so in the stomach, we actually increase the acidity, so we become uh, more acidic, a lower pH, pH tending towards 1. And as that solution is released into the small intestine, if we don't neutralize the higher level of acidity or the lower pH, we're going to destroy or we could begin to digest and break apart our small intestine, which would not be conducive for life. So right near the beginning of the small intestine where it empties the stomach, we release this digestive juice through the pancreatic duct and the common bile duct into the small intestine. And this is going to neutralize and aid in that pH balance 
So the pancreas will neutralize any of those acids that are left over from the digestive um, breakdown of protein in the stomach. Okay, so now that we're familiar with some of the basics of the digestive tract and the basics of the three digestive organs that help to support the function of the digestive system, let's take a step back and look at the GI tract anatomy. Now, the anatomy here is going to define the physiology just like we've talked about all semester. In the physiology, we have to do three different things. We have to be able to digest food, we have to be able to absorb food, and we have to be able to move that substance or those substances along the digestive tract to facilitate both of those first two processes. And the way that this is done is by some very unique histology or tissue makeup of the digestive tract. So the GI tract is going to be comprised of four layers of tissue. And we are going to find each of these four layers along the whole tract. And this includes the stomach. So as we leave the mouth and the pharynx and enter the esophagus, the, uh, esophag the esophagus all along the whole tract throughout esophagus, stomach, small and large intestine, we're going to find these four layers of tissue. And I'm going to introduce you to these four layers of tissue working from the inner layer to the outer layer. So please remember that the inside of any tube or organ is referred to as the lumen. So this is the lumen, and the lumen has a luminal wall. And that's where we're going to start. That luminal wall is made up of a tissue called mucosa. So this mucosa layer forms the lumen forms the lumen of the digestive tract. Now, it's through this mucosa, as we move along the digestive tract, that the nutrients that have been consumed by the individual are going to have to cross in order to enter the bloodstream. Now, this mucosa and the, the wall of the in, uh, digestive tract, that luminal wall, is actually going to change as we move through the digestive tract. And as it changes, the anatomy is going to change, and this is going to lead to a change in the function. And so all along the digestive tract, from the esophagus down to the large intestine and everything in between, we're going to have different functions. So we're going to induce various functions. And really, one of the big things that happens is as we move into the small intestine and through the small intestine, we're increasing the surface area for contact. And this makes a lot of sense because as we move through the digestive system, we're breaking down the food that's been consumed into smaller and smaller uh, uh, sizes of particle. And eventually we're going to get down to individual molecules of glucose and individual amino acids and individual lipids, and we're going to need to absorb them. And the more surface area we have for absorption, the more efficient that process is going to be. And so this is going to be the responsibility of the luminal wall, this layer of tissue called the mucosa. Now the next layer out, 
from the mucosa is called the submucosa. And the submucosa is primarily going to be made up of this connective tissue. And it's also going to have some glands present as well. But primarily it's a connective tissue. And just like all of the other connective tissues that we observed or discussed this semester, this connective tissue will be the site of blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics. So we're going to have the blood supply, the nervous supply, and the lymphatic supply contained within this submucosa. And that's what you can actually see here. This is our, um, our nervous system supply. These are nerves that come in and innervate all different parts of the uh, intestine. You can also see we have our blood supply coming in, forming capillary beds within the tissue. The next layer out from the submucosa, so mucosa, submucosa, the third layer out is going to be called the muscularis. And the muscularis, just like its name suggests, is going to be layers of muscle. The muscularis is going to consist or can be comprised of two to three sublayers. So within this muscle layer called the muscularis, and you can see in this figure there are two layers of muscularis. Depending on where we are located in the digestive system, we would find two to three of these sublayers. And the muscle is going to be oriented in different directions. We find two throughout most of the small intestine and large intestine. We find three layers in the stomach. So what kind of muscle should we expect here? Well, we should expect smooth muscle. So as I said, stomach has the extra layer. I'm going to say that we have an inner and outer layer throughout most of the digestive system, and then we have a middle layer in the stomach. The inner layer is going to be oriented in a circular orientation. In other words, that means that the muscle fibers here wrap around, and that's what you can see here in this first layer of muscularis, is they wrap around the diameter, or around the circumference, rather, of the digestive tract. So the fibers, the smooth muscle fibers, are oriented around the tube. When these muscles are stimulated to contract, they have a drawstring. You think about a stuff sack for a sleeping bag. You pull on that drawstring and it reduces the circumference. These muscles, when they contract, have that drawstring type squeeze. Now, most of the digestive tract only has an inner and an outer layer. And we'll come back and we'll talk about that middle layer in reference to the stomach in just a second. The outer layer, the fibers, the smooth muscle fibers, are going to be oriented lateral along the tube. So these fibers here, and you can see it represented here really well, they, they kind of lay parallel to the tube follow the structure of the tube around rather than circling around it, they move along it. And when these fibers are stimulated to contract, it provides a massaging type squeeze. All right, so in the stomach, we have an extra layer. And this extra layer is actually in between the two layers that I've just talked about, our circular layer and our lateral layer. 
we'll call it a middle layer. And really what you have is you have an angle that's basically between a circular layer and a lateral layer. So I'm going to just simply call it a diagonal orientation. Now, when these contract, it's just simply going to add another vector or another way for the muscle to contract to affect the stomach as it is churning and digesting and breaking up the food that's stored within it. So this is just simply going to add another vector of movement. All right, so mucosa, submucosa the muscularis, and then we have finally an outer layer of tissue, and that outer layer of tissue is the serosa. This is another connective tissue layer. And it's going to act as a covering or a sheath. over the entire digestive tract and it's going to provide a protective layer. It's also going to provide connection of the gastrointestinal tract to the body cavity so that the GI tract is not just simply floating within the abdominal cavity not just floating within the body.